Uh, very good morning to you all once again. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to Proverbs, the 10th chapter, Proverbs 10, um, and all of it, uh, but we will be focusing on a handful of them through it. Uh, as we discover parental joy in a wise child, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This bit of wisdom toward parents from Solomon speaks to the joy of children set on the wise path who walk that path of wisdom on their own when they're adults. This weight is placed uh, upon parents, yes, but also disciple makers. Like every stage of childhood in the family home comes young Christians, immature, lacking discernment, needing wisdom. So we can also put this to true children in the faith when we make disciples and raise up the next generation. This passage today speaks to everyone in the community of Christ even now. Whether you are a child still learning, or a parent tasked with the shaping of young minds, a new Christian, or a wise disciple maker, there is joy and sorrow knowing the path ahead of us is uh, with so many dangers requiring, requiring the wisdom that we, we gather and glean from in the scriptures. Because I ask questions like, did I teach them enough? Did I learn enough myself? Are they ready for all of life's troubles as I kick them out the front door to lead the lives on their own? Am I ready? So all these things in mind as we approach Proverbs 10 together, I will read this is the holy word of our God. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in, in harvest is a son who brings, uh, brings shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise, of, the wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who, is, who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. A rich man's wealth is, is his strong city, but poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instructions is on the path to life. But he who rejects reproof leads others astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and who, whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lip is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. What the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes is the sluggard to those who send him. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the, the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. 
The lips of the righteous knows what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse. And as the word of the Lord, let's go before him in prayer and seek his help. Lord, with our Bibles open and hearing the collected Proverbs of Solomon the wise, Lord, may we receive them humbly. May we hear your word, O Lord, and direct our paths. Bless us, O God, with the needed mercies to continue walking this path. Meet with us here in mercy, O God. Wherever we are at, give strength to us when we are weak. Give joy to us in our sorrows. But above all, O Lord, may we see clearly and treasure Christ above all. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have come to learn, being a dad, that raising children pre presents so many challenges. Parents learn as they go. That's one thing that I've learned. And often finding out that raising children requires far more resources than I really have. It is a lesson on dependence upon God's providence, precious mercies, providing wisdom and joy and peace. So much of raising children is found in their little eyes watching me as I parent. And our homes send these children into the world as adults. A world driven by success, a world driven by pleasure, wealth, and a good name, or driven by the lust which comes natural to the human sinful heart. And because of this, worldly parents, are, they're content, they're satisfied that their children just choose success, wealth, and a good name. There, you're a good person. Yet Solomon speaks here of joy and the hearts of their parents. Look at that in verse 1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Children naturally come out into this world sinfully selfish. Their initial reaction to discipline will be focused on how parenting hurts their feelings. Yet Solomon tells us something on the other side, that his son is to be concerned about his mother and father's feelings. A wise son is concerned about the heart of his parents. Whatever trials and sins which await the lives of my children, my heart is deeply invested in their salvation. To know Christ above all. I know they will do foolish things. I know that. But will these things drive them to Christ? Or will they continue driving on their own path, leaning on their own understanding? What I found is there is joy in the depths of a parent's heart when they see their children as wise. Not merely content that their child turned out to be a halfway decent person. That's not what he's saying. Well, at least they're decent. Boy, does that bring me joy. No, this is deeper than that. If raising the child to only be a good enough person is a parent's goal, you will look one day upon your adult child with grief in your heart. Solomon here is speaking of something more eternally precious than merely a good name and being a decent person. Solomon speaks of a mother and a father looking at their child and seeing wise wisdom. They see their child making wise choices, informed by God and dependent upon God. The way they see careers, how they love those who hate them, how they choose a spouse and how they treat them, how they form a home blessed by God's peace and joy, how they raise their own children in the discipline of the Lord. He, Solomon says this a little bit later in chapter 17 and verse 25. He says, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. You see the, the, the weight of the grief of parents who are looking at their child making foolish decisions and walking the path of fools. So the parents in Solomon's introduction of this chapter are older, sitting in the pew, ready to hear the opening prayer at church one day. And they glance over and see their adult child joyfully ready to worship the Lord as well. And their heart is joyful. Now, I say that last line with a great deal of pain because that's not guaranteed. 
The parents may be wise, but now Solomon tells his child who has heard all this wisdom, don't turn from it. Don't walk the path of fools, no matter how attractive you think it is. You will grieve your mother's heart if you do. That's a foolish son who says, I don't care. I don't care about my mom's heart. I don't care about my father's heart. I will walk the path of fools. And he is warning him, do not turn from wisdom. When a child leaves their home rich with godly virtue, there is joy in his or her parents' smile. Yet heavy grief visits the parent's heart when a child walks the path of fools. Mom and dad invest more than simply information to their children. They are emotionally invested in their children's richness of faith. Dear child, there is a God on the throne in heaven and one day you will stand before him and to be judged. Will wisdom see clearly his grace in the sufferings and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, rejoicing in the salvation that is provided for you? Or will foolishness drive you all the days of your life right into judgment? The lesson is more than parents to children. We are each commanded to make disciples to have spiritual children. And this is our warning to them. In Hebrews Chapter 13, verse 17, it goes further. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Of course, here we're, we're talking about elders and teachers in the church, and the pastor's joys in the wisdom of the flock he serves. He says, Let, them, let him do this with joy. Speaking of wise thinking, wise speaking, and wise loving of the church. But it goes even more in, chapter, in 3 John, verse 4. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. You can hear Solomon say that a parent, grandparent, pastor, disciple maker, they're looking at someone and saying, Oh, nothing gives me greater joy than to seeing you walk in the truth. For a pastor and every disciple maker to see someone flourish in the faith. Wisdom is the nourishment in their soul. Truth is the path that they are walking, making glad the spiritual parent's heart. That's what he's saying. Look, I, nothing gives me greater joy, says Pastor John. So he says, now Solomon is saying, this would give joy to my heart to see my children become adults who love the Lord with all their mind and heart and strength. Uh, these wise truths together, we are all being led. Let those who lead us do that with joy. Children, your parents' joy in parenting you is a sweet, peaceful relationship that is good for you, is for your benefit. Listen to your parents' wisdom and be wise. When those who lead you have a joyful heart, the relationship is sweet, the fellowship is delightful, and you look forward to being together. And coming back to Proverbs 10, look at this in 3 through 5. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the cravings of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. You can hear Solomon, my child, if you are wisely following the Lord, he will not let you go hungry. But he will withhold things in your foolishness that your cravings would bring you pain. He's talking more than food here, isn't he? If you get lazy, the Lord will not let you stay lazy. If your cravings are for unrighteousness, the Lord will make you feel the pain of unsatisfaction so that you will turn to him. If you are stuck on an evil path, the Lord will not encourage you to continue going down that path to sin, but displays wisdom in repentance and obedience in the Lord as something attractive when you're in that pain, pulling you toward himself. May our cravings be holy. Dear church, may our cravings be for his righteousness. And may those cravings find us at the Lord's table of mercies rather than the pleasures of the world, which only leads to ruin 
and not life. That's what Solomon is saying. Now, I've learned I have, I have many hopes for my children. My imagination can run wild. What they might be like, what they would do for a living when they get older. But as the further that I read into Proverbs, I, I, this constant weight tugs at my heart. Will, will they become adults who are amazed at Jesus? And I mean amazed. Have we, as their parents, their mom and dad, given them more than information about Jesus, but have set the table to taste and see that the Lord is good? I, my wife makes an amazing Zupa Toscana. It's, it is amazing. And I, I know it's not quite fall, but uh, my house has transitioned into soup mode. Football's on. It's getting cooler. Look outside. It's gloomy. It's soup time. And she, she first tells me what's for dinner. Then all the delightful smells, especially the bacon. It just fills the air. It starts to fill this house in prepar preparation to come to the meal together. My appetite has been whetted, right? My cravings lead me to the table. I dare not go for snacks along the way because my delight is in this soup. In a much, much deeper way. We who lead others, parents, pastors, disciple makers, we, we, we whet the spiritual appetites of those under our care as those who have to give an account. We present Christ to enjoy him in truth, to stir their appetite in their hearts, to live lives to the glory of God. If we're going to church, not because I just told you, but because Jesus is someone to be delighted in. I don't just want to go there to hear truth and say, well, there's a lot of factual information. Thank you very much. Am I leading them to see in awe of who Christ is and what he has done? A few, um, and a, a few of these collected Proverbs deals with what we talk about as well. Look at me in verse 8. It's just one of many in chapter 10. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Wisdom is in a heart humbly ready to hear truth and receive it. But a foolish person speaks in ways which displeases God and invites in themselves a life of ruin. They talk a lot of game. Talk about why I'm rebelling against God. Why I hate the church. Why I don't, I'm not in awe of Christ. Why I hate his factual information. Any of it. He says that's a babbling fool. And one who comes before the Lord humble is receiving instruction. I have walked the fat path of fools once again, Lord. Lead me. Guide me. The fool hides hatred in the heart behind this mask of being cordial and nice, but then spreading slander behind others' back rather than speaking with lips of wisdom. This is destructive lips with a heart walking toward ruin, Solomon warns. Don't go that way, my child. Another storehouse of wisdom is exposed in how we talk. Um, it, our, our mouths are made to express what's going on in the heart, but it is just the tip of the iceberg. Your heart is a storehouse of information. What you are storing in there and what you are treasuring in there is going to come out here. Is your tongue bitter? Is your tongue one to ruin others in order to make your own ruin not seem as bad? That's where Solomon is warning. His foolishness is storing facts about others in a sinful, critical, judgmental way. I'm going to store facts about the world, store facts about my neighbor in such a way to bring them ruin. That my ruin doesn't look so bad. And they use their lips for violence, Solomon says. They use their lips for division, to separate relationships, to undermine, to hurt, to wound, to split. Wisdom speaks truth with a heart storing true words, Solomon says. That's somebody you actually look forward to hearing. Oh, I can't wait to hear them talk because I know what we're going to talk about. What a joy it is to be with them. What a joy, because their heart's not bitter and their tongue's not bitter. They come to me and they speak precious truths about who God is. We're just enjoying our relationship. We can just sit and enjoy a meal together, and I look forward to it. 
wisdom speaks truth from the words that we store into our hearts of the preciousness of who Christ is and also his wisdom. And how does wisdom speak to you? How does wisdom speak to you? Let me put it another way. How do, how do you want Jesus to tell you the truth? Because he's going to tell you the truth. But how would you like that be conveyed to you? You have foolish ideas. And you are utterly wicked, deserving wrath. There, the, this is a truth which must be met with fear in our hearts that God is wrathful against sin. Yes, just look to Christ's sufferings and at the cross. There you will meet what God thinks of his wrath, his holiness, and in our sin. And grace teaches our hearts to fear, yet we see at the cross of Christ that grace re relieves those fears that we may delight in God as our Father. And what I've learned is, you know, just going over chapter 10 multiple times, having smarts in itself does not bring joy to the heart. Wisdom does. How are we gonna, if my kids get multiple PhDs, it's going to mean absolutely nothing if they do not have all with Christ. There are plenty of smart people who speak words which are philosophically true, but wisdom speaks with love and healing and deliverance. There's a difference in the wise tongue coming from a wise heart. And what is interesting in the, in the rhymes of like YouTube and social media and blogs and podcasts is that everyone has a truth to shout very loudly at each other, and sometimes it is a presentation of facts, including facts about God. But I hear no wisdom of a delight in those truths. And it's, it's, it's so lacking that it, to encourage me to not just know the factual things of God, the truths that we come from Scripture. And at the end of that presentation, it shouldn't be how I can destroy other people, but how can I be in awe of who Christ is? Because I'm the fool in this passage. I'm the one who doesn't deserve to have this preciousness before God to treasure Jesus. I, I, I have found Jesus to be good news for a sinful fool like me. How we think and feel about God will come to our lips. It's our manner of speech of the church of Jesus Christ, who is the salt of the earth, how we talk to one another, how do we engage the world. There's a lot of those how-to things, but I can tell you, at least from Proverbs, our, our one is we go and speak to them truth from a heart that is filled with awe of who Christ is and what he has done. We will speak of how we know him. I know him as my Lord. I know him as my Savior. Look with me in verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Here, God imparts wisdom in community. Wisdom is something that is displayed through the lips in community. It's not just something storing up smarts. Wisdom's posture comes from a character in the depths of the heart, not one of hatred to stir up the crowd to divide, but as a peacemaker, making peace in God. The wise child of God finds such gladness in a life with God that he or she lives to make others glad in God. It is from an unhappiness with God. Such a heart brings God's community to ruin and divisiveness. But it's even more than this. James writes in his epistle in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, the, the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. They, they go out of their way to make peace rather than continue the divisiveness. The divine wisdom from above is troubling to us, isn't it? I mean, you hear it, you know, well, that's a really good thing to put in practice. We think, well, the world is full of lies. They can't handle my truth. They can't handle the truth from me. That's what's going on. I'm a truth speaker, and they're just trying to shut me down and censor me. It may be that. Yet I find a troubling trend in Christianity today because our Savior is not simply factually true. 
He makes peace. He makes peace with fools and the wicked. Think about yourself. He made peace for you. What were you when Jesus made peace with you? Where did he find us? I can tell you that I was an enemy. Hostile in mind. Hostile toward God. Believing foolishness. Believing lies. Do you receive the truth of the Savior as commands to be sown in peace and to work in peace? Or as a set of facts to proudly display your knowledge of God while tearing people and relationships apart? Allow me to clear something in our minds as kind of an exercise, myself included, so I'm not outside of this. We are the wicked fools here. Jesus is the wise son. He made peace with us, enemy fool, wicked fools, and he sets us on the path of his righteousness. We often look out of place on this path, don't we? But he forgives, and he places the wandering back on the path. He renews strength to the weak. He grants repentance to the sinful, and he makes wise the simple fools on this path. Now, since we know our context here, Let's examine fools along the way, because you're going to meet many, many fools. They are enemy wicked fools, aren't they? Do they hear us with wise truths, calling them gently to repent with a clear view of who Jesus is, presenting him as good news to savor and to delight in God with a glad heart? Or do they or do we tell enemy wicked fools of their foolishness with the Bible as a set of facts only to condemn them? Imagine a preacher who quotes scripture. He tells accurately of all of his demands, sets up accurately Christ as the judge and king of all, but presents these facts with no care for lost sinners in misery. Like Spurgeon's quote, know Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. Christ is to be the parents disciplining. Even even in serious sin, Christ is to be our disciple-making and teaching. I don't want to just present to my children a set of facts that are truth about Jesus and just leave it there. Dear child, come to savor and delight in God. That's wisdom. Christ is to be our correcting the evils of the world and sinners that we encounter on our path who are foolish and blind. Is Christ in our sermons to sinners? We have someone worth preaching to those who are hostile enemies. We have someone worth preaching to the wicked fools we encounter along the way. The wise truth of Christ is who is, yes, to be feared, but has a saving grace and a heart lowly and gentle calling on the simple to follow him and find life. God is wrathful to sinners, but if you turn to Jesus, you will find a God of infinite mercy, beautiful beautiful wisdom to make you wise who are simple. Parents are to raise children And disciple makers are to raise true children in the faith who know Christ and his word well, yes, but received such marvelous grace with a meek, teachable, gentle, peace sowing heart. May God grant to all of us wisdom to raise up disciples after us, true children in the faith, wisely knowing and wisely delighting in Jesus and his precious word. This requires something of us, though. If we're to fill the storehouses of knowledge in the hearts of those under our care, then we should be storing up knowledge with a wise heart in order to speak such wisdom. I mean, you put all the speech uh, verses in chapter 10 together, and that's what you will find. I receive, by my own humbleness before God, His wisdom, and I treasure it myself. And instead of being a wicked fool, which comes naturally, now my lips speak his wisdom, which I treasure. And I invite my children, I invite under my care, I invite fools on the path on the way that I meet. Come, come to the preciousness of the mercies of God. 
find these with the wise truth something to delight in. Um, we are to be wise children of our heavenly father who commands us to honor our mother and our father in God's covenant community relationship in reflection of us to God. Think of this. In Jesus' servant on the Mount. He taught how the Father delivers us from, you know, natural hypo hypocrisy and our anxiety, which comes natural to us. These are symptoms of which uh, are storing the, the, you know, it's that pursuit of wrong treasures, Jesus says. You, you're trying to pursue earthly treasures and store it up in the wrong bank vault. That's here on earth. But then he says, store up treasures in heaven rather than on earth, where moths destroy and thieves can break in and steal think about this for a minute a wise heart treasures eternal things above earthly things a foolish heart treasures earthly things and in all likelihood does his best effort to never be confronted about eternal things at all you just say you just say something foolish in his heart ah, there is no god or at least he's not going to judge me the fool is made anxious by the treasures he's pursuing not because of guilt or anything, but the possibility of losing them is what Jesus is getting at. You, moths can destroy them. A thief can break in and take them. And that's what's causing anxiety. The ability that you might lose in it. And gospel joy is found in treasuring what cannot be taken from us. So we just prayed the prayer of assurance. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That's the treasure that we're storing up. Wisdom stores this knowledge to treasure this great treasure of heaven, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in our hearts. And may your heart feel the joy of him, delighting in him and delighting in his word, tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And then we invite others to come, taste and see with me, the Lord is good. Solomon continues on in verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. Now, it raises that question. How does the fear of the Lord prolong life? Again, it's a proverb and not a promise. Often the wicked live, live to be old and the righteous die young. In general, the fear of the Lord and, and stress have a relationship. Uh, our fleshly fears will lead to sorrow. Wise fear of the Lord is trust in his deliverance. Faith looks to Christ who never panics in his sovereign hand of controlling the orbit of the stars and planets or in the management of my life on this tiny little rock. He is not in the panic mode with his sovereign hand on me. But then he continues on verse 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. And here is where our fears will betray us. Because where is your fear lying? We, we plan and we expect returns on our investments. But we forget James' warning that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. What is your life? James asks. For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Our trouble isn't that time moves too quickly. That's what we say to each other. In reality, our trouble is that time moves at all time ages us it ages us toward death it ages us for that great fear that jesus put his finger on that we could lose it all i can lose stuff i can lose my life and no matter how good you are and how much money and insurance you accumulate your expectations will perish along with you how can Hope of the future bring us joy here and now, Jesus. How can this bring me joy? Christ brings joy to the Father and to, be, and to we the wise who persevere trusting in all Jesus has done for us, we will be invited into the joy of our Master. There, beloved, is your joy. There is the treasure to be storing up. In verses 29 and 30, Solomon says, The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. 
Children, when God commands you to honor your mother and your father, he stirs your heart to care for their hearts. He makes you feel the gravity of what brings them joy and what brings them grief. Do you pursue wisdom and see a joyful peace resting in your parents' heart when they see you and they think of you? Or do you dishonor them and grieve their hearts where their nights are long and their faces are sorrowful? Listen closely. Such grief comes to the heart of our Heavenly Father when you sin dishonoring your parents. This goes for all of us. Do we bring joy to the heart of those who are attached to care for us, to lead us? To the heart of our Heavenly Father. Only the wise child brings such joy to the heart of the Heavenly Father. If you have been foolish, sinful, grieving his heart, I encourage you to look to Christ. His cross is, is a display of the Father's love for sinners. Sin traps us, but the griefs and, and sorrows of sin is what Christ has carried. The punishment Jesus has taken brings peace to those who believe upon him. It is in Christ, and it is only in Christ, that you can be free from the burden of sin, and that you can hear the voice of your heavenly Father say, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. For the Father is pleased in Jesus the Son and those who seek refuge in him. In Christ, his sufferings, death, resurrection, ascension to power as the eternal king. The power and strength and yes, compassion of the heart of Jesus Christ calls you to humbly listen to him. He is the wise son. Turn away from evil which destroys and turn toward his goodness and mercy which brings life and follows you all the days of your life. Turn from ruin of dishonor to Christ who obeyed the Father perfectly and honored perfectly that you may enjoy God as your Father. Yes, and you will find that you will taste and you will see that the Lord is good.